Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Um, this uh, Monday night, <laughs> it's a little late. I don't know what time it is. It's ah, it's it's eleven thirty. Anyway, but uh, uh, I just remembered uh, that I wanted to share a story with you uh, from when I was um, when I was in high school. And I don't know if you might find this interesting, but I always found this story very interesting. Anyway, I was due, and I wanted to go into the Marine Corps, and I was doing all the depth training, this kind of stuff, two years before. Like, I was um, already from the beginning of my my my, my 11th year, my I was, I was still in my 10th year of high school, I believe. I was already doing, I was 16 years old doing depth training. I mean, it was really cool. I was going on the weekends and doing all that, and I had a great time with the Marine recruiters and and. The Marine recruiter I, I had, um, I remember he um, was a force recon Marine, had been airborne school, scuba qualified, all this kind of stuff. And he, um, yeah, he was, a, he was a really short guy. But then again, at that time, I was still, I, I wasn't yet six foot at the time. You know, I was, uh, uh, I was about five foot ten or something like that. But, um, but uh, yeah, I was preparing to go into the Marine Corps. And uh, my 11th year, my dad, he sort of took me aside and said, you don't want to go into Marine Corps because... You know they kill people, and uh, <laughs> being a young, hmm, stupid boy, that motivated me even more. I guess you know that adventure, the idea that you know, um, and it's a foolish idea that actually this is how they get people into the military is the idea that they're going to go to war. And uh, but later on, I found out that um, you know even though I had gone to war and um and seen and done things in war um yeah anyway um but my dad what he did he went out and got the army recruiter and then the army recruiter got me in and i went into a delayed entry program not, not delayed entry program. i went into a split option actually so with the basic training my junior year the summer to my, after my junior year that summer and then came back finished my senior year and then i went back and uh went on and and, um, and finished up my training and, and got to my unit and just had a, and, um, in my career. But anyway, he had a really good friend my dad did, and um, I don't remember his name. I do remember that he was a big guy, um, and he and my father are about the same age, I guess. Um, I don't even know if he's still living, uh, but my dad and him were very good friends, my dad being a soldier, but he was a Marine. And... He would tell all these stories, and I would, man, I would just, I love just sitting around listening to these stories, and, and, and I had done it my entire life, even from my grandfather and his friends, and um, just anybody I could, you know, I always wanted to be a soldier, always wanted to serve in the military from a very young age. My mom told me one time that I was probably the only person she ever knew that from day one, what he wanted to do, he actually did it, you know, and so, um, yeah, <laughs> anyway, um, but he had lent me actually his, um, his recruit, uh, annual, uh, with all the pictures in it, this kind of stuff, and, and he was even a big guy when he went to his re recruit training, and I believe he was, um, I believe he may have been drafted, I'm not sure, um, but anyway, he had, uh, he had gone through his, uh, Marine recruit training, in California, and um, I just read, looked at this book every day. I looked at this book every day. I, I really just enjoyed looking at all the pictures from the 60s uh, and early 70s. And But anyway, I remember he told me um, about after he finished his, his, his recruit training, he got sent to, Mar to with, the, um, with the Marines from his, with other Marines straight to Vietnam, and, and they arrived um and I don't remember where he arrived at, but it was, it was of the where the Marine um, um, recruits arrived. And um, there was two things about this story that really astonished me, and that was when he arrived. He arrived in his Marine Corps fatigues with his black leather boots and his Marine Corps cap and other uniform items, and then there they they issued him brand new. Uh, they issued him a brand new boonie hat, uh, two sets of jungle fatigues, new socks, jungle boots, um, some t-shirts, 
whatever, you know, this this kind of stuff. They issued to them brand new. And um, I think some, uh, a few other things. But they told them, you know, you go around the back to get your TA-50, is what we called it, but it's basically all their equipment and their weapons and that kind of stuff. So he ran around the back, and there was these piles, he said, of different equipment, like one pile of M16s, one pile of rucksacks, one pile of helmets, one pile of of web belts, one pile of suspensions, one pile of uh, of canteens, and um, one pile of uh, magazine pouches, you know, and, and this is what they had. They had all these piles of stuff there, and um, he said that they basically had, like, the whole day to go through it. And the first thing he did is that he, he went through the pile of M16s, and he basically, they were completely muddy, so even bloody. All the material he said was muddy and bloody. Uh, it basically, as they... As Marines were leaving, they were basically, if they were wounded, they were basically putting their equipment in these piles. What and, and they didn't even care if it was serviceable or not. They just had to, he had to make it serviceable. He said they, he spent the whole day, you know, collecting up what he needed. He said it took him a long time putting together a complete M16 that would that would that would shoot. And they went down and shot, and this one had a straight barrel, and, and he was able to shoot and and, qual and and just sort of zero in the weapon. But he got all of his equipment together. I think they even had flak vests, just kind of like that. And then the next day or next couple of days, they 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 boarded them up on Chinooks and they flew them out uh, into the jungle, into the rice paddies where they um, they arrived in this valley in the rice paddies uh, below a camp, uh, which is up on the mountain. He said. He said uh, they all exited the bird. The same way they were trained to, they all jumped into the rice paddy, into the mud, pulling security as they, as they exited the bird. And as the bird flew off, they could hear guys up on the hill just laughing at him. He said, then they hiked up the hill. And um, when they got up there, the same bird that had, <laughs> that had dropped them off in the valley was sitting up on top of the hill. And... Um, we took a while to get up to. He said up there they were like, uh, you know, they were unloading rations from the bird that was there on the bird with them. They were unloading mail, this kind of stuff. And he walked by thinking, what the fuck, you know, <laughs> what's going on here? But uh, he said there was this one guy came up to him and said, and handed him an M60 machine gun. And he said, okay. And he took his M16 from him. And the guy went and got on the, on the bird. And from that, that moment on, he carried the M60 machine gun. And um, he had shown me his pictures like when they were in Vietnam, they had the mule, this kind of stuff, different vehicles, and, and when he was at camp, this kind of stuff. And and um, But it was an interesting story, a story that's always rested with me throughout my life. I remember the story, you know, the way he told it to me, and just that introduction to his unit, to his platoon, uh, when he got to Vietnam, and, and just the the several points that were made up and it was basically how a new guy was treated, um, arriving in Vietnam, how the Marines had absolutely no money for equipment. They hadn't, I mean, he said he would see, a, a, a um, army soldiers and air force. And these guys were, were dressed head to toe in brand new kit when they got there. And, and, uh, but you got a Marines there who are just basically having to, um, do all they can to find their, their kit, to scavenge, scavenge a kit, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, uh, but he spent his year in Vietnam. He survived, and uh, he basically returned the same way he uh, he arrived there. As someone was uh, as someone was arriving, he handed off his M60 machine gun, and and, and um, he grabbed that M16 and came back. And um, but he did one tour. He got back to the to the states and 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 um, started his life outside the military. But just a just a crazy story, I thought, and and. That along with the stories of growing up, uh, I remember um, I was pretty young still, probably kindergarten age, and my dad had uh, had gone off to Vietnam uh, before that, and uh, uh, I remember when he got back, uh, the day he got back, um, and um, just how happy everybody seemed to be in the family, and and uh, and uh, it was a sort of a extraordinary day for us because. You know, my grandfather, um, my mother's father, he had fought in the Pacific War, and uh, he was an, an infantryman, a mortarman, actually, and fought with the uh, 20th Infantry Regiment, part of the 6th Infantry Division, and he fought in the Philippines and in uh, 
um, Saipan, I believe it's Saipan, and a few other places like that. But uh, I have a book about it, about where he where he's fought with the unit he was with. But uh, I used to, I remember um, the men would all grab a beer and uh, they would open up the hood of the car and they'd all stand around the car and and they would just talk. And my dad would talk about his time in the, in the Vietnam War and then of course my um, my grandfather and a couple of his buddies. There, I remember Mr. Willard and those guys, they all served together and they would stand around and and, uh, um, and talk about their time. And I would just, every once in a while, I'd be able to get in there, wouldn't be, get, didn't get shooed away, but listen to some of the stories they would tell. And it was just um, just incredible, you know. And like I said, I have my grandfather's, I have my grandfather's bronze star here. And uh, a friend of mine came over the other day and he's, he watched a video where I was talking about this and he checked out the back which clearly has my grandfather's, um, you know, name on it, Fred Mafus, you know. So, um, but um, but to hear those stories, you know, about, you know, from, from those guys from back then. Now, I don't remember all of them, but uh, I do remember them all opening up these big cans of beer, um, you know. And at that time, I think they were still, they were still using a can opener to, uh, they like oil cans, you know, to, to get into them. But, um yeah, just just incredible times, and 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 I remember my own experiences coming back, and I remember when I got back from the Gulf War '91. Um, I was like the only person from my unit to uh, to go there. I was I I had uh, been selected to go there, um, and um, to fill a specific position while I was there, and then when I got back, um, I remember I flew back with a unit out of Kitzigan, Germany. And I was stationed in Würzburg at Leighton Barracks. And I remember uh, because I had my weapon with me that um, they had to come get me in a military TMP. And it was my, my roommate, my best buddy, Dave Kraut, that came and got me. And when I got back to the barracks, there was no homecoming, no welcoming. It was just us, you know, a couple of the guys, you know. And, uh, and it wasn't very long after that I met my wife. Um, actually, it was probably a couple of months after that I met my wife. Uh, but uh, I... I think two weeks later I went home on leave and um, um, I'd gotten back home to Louisiana and my uncle, my uncle Danny, he had served in uh, the Gulf War with the Louisiana National Guard. They had sent a, uh, a um, they had sent an, L I think he was in a communication unit, but I don't think he did. I think he was in charge of the post while he was there, you know, because uh, he was a warrant officer and, and, and you know how warrant officers when it comes to work, you know, <laughs> he had got a good job. But uh, he was he was lucky enough to be in the rear with the gear, and I was way forward, you know, way way forward actually, um, probably about as forward as, as you can get with all the other guys. But uh, um, I remember um, they had flown back while I was on leave, and and I was remembering how when I arrived, I arrived with another unit, and they were all having a party, and I just sort of like, you know, said, okay, I'm out of here, you know, and uh, I. Uh, you know, caught a ride. My buddy came and got me, and, and I got I got a ride back uh, from Kitsigan to Leighton Barracks. Nothing. You know, I I, ne I never had all these parties and that kind of stuff. Get coming back. I never, you know, um, I didn't expect them either, and, and and I really didn't need that kind of stuff. For me, it was never it was never about that. But uh, I'm not someone who likes to be patted on the back and and um, and and people. I mean, I feel embarrassed when you know when people tell me thank you for your service and that kind of stuff it, it's always just embarrassed me you know I didn't know I don't know what to say um because I did what I wanted to, I did something I loved and and I didn't need thank yous for that you know and and you know I didn't get a lot of medals in the army and and um and uh and I didn't need all that I mean I was really happy just just being in there and doing what I was doing and and um and during the Gulf War I was in a situation where I probably should have gotten a medal for something I had done um two instances in one night actually but um you know i know i know what i did and, and i moved on with life and, and, and it doesn't matter you know i don't i don't have any kind of uh <laughs> you know they gave all the bronze stars out to all the officers and those of us who who were doing other stuff you know we um yeah we just moved on with life you know but i remember um standing in the crowd with my mom and my dad and the family when the tower air flight flew in from uh, from Europe, from Saudi Arabia, and my uncle's unit arrived, and, and they were wearing desert camo. And the other thing is that we didn't get desert camo until after the war. <laughs> we didn't. I mean, 
but then again, I was w working primarily at night, you know, uh, with the job I was doing. We were doing most of our operations at night, so but we didn't have um, we didn't have even we didn't have all that desert camo and that camo. But we got it at the end of the war. I mean, uh, when I got back, actually, I gave um, I gave away. Actually, I gave my uniform, one of my uniforms, completely with um, with um, like my helmet cover and rucksack cover, and and um, I gave a, some other items. I gave to the museum for Third ID because uh, that's who I was stationed with. I was stationed with Third ID in Germany, and um, I gave some pants. I think to my buddy Dave. Yeah, I think I gave him some pants. And I think I may have kept one of the chocolate chip jackets, which, but I did keep the boonie hat, and I have it here somewhere. I don't know where it's at, but I have it here somewhere in the house. It's too small now. <laughs> my head's kept growing, you know. But um I remember seeing my, my uncle Daniel get off the get off the, the plane and they were all in their their desert uniforms or chocolate chip uniforms and, and their they even had desert you know name tags and all this kind of stuff and their they all had their desert combat badge and I thought that was just I thought that was just like what the hell, you know? <laughs> These guys were all in the rear and um yeah and they got that's you and then, uh, anyway so uh, it's typical army stuff the guys that need the kit you know remind me back at the marine my the guy you know the story he told me about you know having a scavenge for equipment and, and you know yeah we didn't we didn't get it to afterwards anyway but i, I remember standing there watching them and they got the the entire works the family showed up you know and and uh um and to see all that you know like, like a parade you know it was like really um it was really strange for me because I never, I never got that in my career, and and like I said, I never needed. I didn't feel jealous or anything. I felt actually pretty happy for them, you know, because uh, no one got killed and and they made it back and and they were good, and that's what matters, you know. But um, yeah, it was a very, um, very strange moment for me watching that happen, you know, and um, and made me feel like I didn't even go. Did I even go to that place? Did I, did I dream all that, you know? But anyway, yeah, it was like that probably my entire career. I mean, uh, my I never had anybody at my graduations, military graduations, none of them. Not not one. I think, well, my wife did come to one of my. She came to my one of my non commissioned officer academy graduations. She came to that, but um, that was it. That's it. I mean, nobody else. <laughs> I just. But then again, I looked at it differently. I didn't look at it as as a like some kind of success. When I finished the school, I looked at it. Okay, this is what I I set out to do, and I did it. And um, and yeah, now it's time to get to work. You know, I, I don't I don't I don't need all that. I I've always been one of those kind of guys. Just just leave it over there, and 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 I'll get it when as I leave. You know, I don't I don't need that recognition. I never have needed it. And even today, you know, um, it's a little bit embarrassing when someone you know, you know, I, you know. <laughs> even even says thank you for something because for me it's just an automatic thing to help if someone needs help you know and um and so yeah it's 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 sort of sort of what has to be done and it's so something my my parents um also uh, my dad was very much that kind of a guy i mean i remember uh the story when katrina happened um uh the next day they were or next couple of days i think they were at church one sunday and um my dad and my mom would, uh, walked out of church and they were getting ready to go home. It was storming and they saw this car with this little guy um, who was trying, who was, had his head under the hood, you know, and, and my dad, you know, stopped and said, hey, what can I, can I help you? You know, the guy's like, you know, he didn't speak any English, the guy, only Spanish. And so, uh, and my parents don't speak anything but English, uh, although my, my, my mother was much better at it than my father was. But um, yeah, so um, they, um, they, um, my dad pulled him, I think, to the house, got him home, and, um, and, uh, they basically got him a shower and fed him and got him some dry clothes. My mom washed his clothes, you know, and, and then they had, my mom called, um, a girlfriend of hers who spoke Spanish, and she spoke to him and, um, found out actually he was, they were escaping New Orleans, um, with the family in a convoy. And um, he was by himself in the car following along. And in, during the storm, they got, they went diff two different directions. And so um, so what we did, so what my parents did basically helped him to get to his family. You know, my uh, I remember my mom said that uh, um, her girlfriend had told him, says, listen, these are good people. 
don't you hurt them, you know, because, you know, people, country folk, they're, you know, they, they, they do things out of kindness of their hearts and a lot of them get hurt because of it, you know, and people take advantage of them and this kind of stuff. But this little guy here, he just wanted to get back to his family and my parents did the most they could. My dad got his car fixed, put some gas in there for him. I think he even gave him some money and, um, and then they led him to where his family was at and then uh, came back home. No high fives, no handshakes, nothing. They didn't need that. You know, they did what was supposed to be done, what you do as a human being. And and, and what we're seeing today is pe people are not doing that so much. I mean, um, you know, I'm from, from America and, and we're one of the biggest giving countries in the world. I mean, even during the the height of the, the Cold War, Russians were eating American grain, made in the USA grain, you know, Um we were feeding our adversary, you know. Uh, you can go to countries and see see this, you know. I mean, all the time, uh, and uh, and um, and sadly, we've lost a lot of um, because of the politics involved. And everything we've lost a lot of uh, our support in the world, you know. You know, I see, I I, I watched, I looked at some TikTok stuff, and and you see, of course, people like you know, uh, you know, talking bad about America. You know, I'm like what the hell? I mean. You go to school for three years in America, and then you talk bad about it? <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, so you had to say pledge allegiance in school? I mean, what do you talk, what are you complaining about? You got a free education, or you got an education, and you got to see something different in the world, you know? Um, you know, I grew up, we grew up without not a lot of money, and we couldn't have afforded to have gone to another country like Switzerland or England, like that, to to have studied, you know, and uh, my kids are very privileged, you know. They they're in two different countries studying and getting educations, you know, and and uh, that's privilege actually. And that's not do it because we're white or because we're black, but has or because we're American, but it has everything to do with the fact that that um, we can do it and we're taking advantage of it. Because when I was growing up, that just it just wasn't on, on the list, you know. You, I, I felt lucky just to have passed high school. You know, I just did not enjoy school that much. You know, I, I I wanted to to do other things in my life, and that wasn't one of them. I should have, <laughs> I should have done more actually, but I didn't. Um, I did go back to university and this kind of stuff like that, and I studied history. Um, and my son studying history, and my daughter criminal psychology. Uh, and my ex-wife, their mother, she is a real brainy. I mean, she's got three master's degrees. And she is um, a big whoop to do it uh, where her job is now. I mean, she's one of the head head honchos up there, and she has a good salary and she's earned it. And I have no regrets for her. You know, even though she's my ex, I'm happy for her. You know, because you know she's earned it. You know, and um, yeah. So I don't I don't have that jealousy or put that blame on something like that. But you know, I feel lucky to have grown up an American. And I feel even more lucky to have grown up in Louisiana, even though it's a bit crappy on a lot of things. Still, you know, I feel privileged that I was able to grow up in the country. Even though we didn't have money, we still we still survived. You know, we worked hard. You know, I had summer jobs since I can, as far as I can remember. And when I wasn't having a summer job that was paying me money, you know, I was doing the old, my dad would say, listen, if you want to eat, you got to work. And so we did everything we could at the house, you know, and that means everything. You know, I mean, uh, a lot of kids are out doing other stuff on Saturdays. I was working, you know, um, and every night we had chores too. We had daily chores, this kind of stuff on top of school. So, yeah, getting back to the story, you know, um, yeah, I, I, it was, it's, it's always been fun, weird to see. And I'm happy for the people to have these big celebrations because they deserve it. You know, they deserve all this stuff, you know, but what I don't agree with is people, complaining about it you know um let's go look at the fourth of july that was yesterday you know um and um which is going on the day before yesterday if i keep talking um i hear i hear people complaining about fireworks or people talking about uh, you know i even heard a, a canadian on a video he was com you know there because something big is they, they discovered um indian children's bodies you know that um that were murdered um uh, by Canadian, um, by by the the Canadian, by the church, I think that was basically hidden up by the Canadian government. Maybe they knew it. I don't know. And of course, this has happened in lots of countries, you know. And um, 
And there's a big fuss about that, and it damn sure should be a big fuss about it. But does that mean you have to feel ashamed of your country? Or you're not going to support your country's Independence Day or, or their National Day? No, because you know what? If you want to, pers to progress, if you want to go forward in this life, you need to learn from your history. You need to make better, you know, and you need to be reminded with those statues, okay, that this is why we're where we're at, but also this is why this is, this is what we have to do to, to get even better and to keep going. Are there problems with racism and this kind of stuff in the world? Yes, of course there is, okay, but look at why. Look at really, really look at why. Why this is happening, okay? Now, I heard something very interesting and a really good argument when you hear the left discussing the fact that uh, they say, well, you know, we have systematic racism in, in, in America and, you know, socialism will be much better, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. And then, and then they, they want to compare it to Scandinavian countries. Well, first of all, their population is much smaller and we're talking about an all-white country, okay? They're all white, okay? They have very little... When it comes to um, foreigners in our country, you know, and it's hard to be a foreigner in a lot of these countries. A lot of these countries, you can't become a member of that con of that country as a foreigner, not ever. But um, so it's not the same arguments; it's the same thing, you know. And so these comparisons cannot be made. But getting back to our own national day, I'm proud to be an American and um, have have the has our in his historically have we have there been mistakes? You betcha, you betcha. Uh, what are we supposed to do about it? Tear down everything? No. We got to make it better. We got to keep working forward. You fix the problem in your own country before you go off to some other country and complain about it. Okay. You fix the problem there. You know, um, no one, no one escapes America to go um, move away for some kind of freedom. People stay there. People are trying to get into America, not people not getting out. And you see the people. You could watch all these videos you want to. People say, "Oh, yeah, I moved to I moved to uh, to Costa Rica," and within a year they're moving back. Why? Because it's not the same country. It's not the same laws, and, and you don't have that privilege there that you think you have. Okay, fifteen hundred bucks a month. No. <laughs> on, and on top of that, ninety nine percent of these people they don't learn the culture. They stick in their little conclave of, of other Americans or other foreigners, you know. And they don't learn a language. You know, I've been here in Switzerland for 25 years. I speak French. Um, and um, I speak some German. And I speak English. And um, my daily life is French. Everything. Except what I choose. And I choose to speak to you in English. Although I can also speak to you in French. <laughs> and I probably should make more of these videos in French. But anyway... Um, I want to thank all of you guys who've been watching my videos and listening to my, my blah, 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 as I say, you know, and, um, my favorite, one of my favorite, uh, st uh, things I say is that when I'm at work and I see people sitting around, you know, bullshitting, I say less blah, 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 and more cha-cha-cha. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you for watching my videos, and there are a lot of you out there who do watch my videos, and, and, and um, and some of you, I thank you for the feedback because, you know, the feedback has been really nice, you know. Um, and um, yesterday I had a good conversation with a very good brother of mine, a very good friend of mine who's helped me so much um, in some really bad places I was at in my brain, you know. And and um, he's dealing with some of the same things I'm dealing with right now. <laughs> but uh, he's a great guy and um, love him like a blood brother. You know, he's just a really great guy and... and uh, um, but uh, he and his um, his future wife were telling me that they watch my videos and that that um, that I've improved. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, I've got a lot of videos so far, but uh, and um, I guess from the beginning you'll see how much they've improved. And and yeah, I hope I hope they have. I want to get better. Um, but um, I also want to bring you bring to you better content, better things, you know, more stories and that kind of stuff. And as I remember things, I'm definitely going to talk to you about them. Um, but, um, yeah. Um, anyway, a little bit of feedback. Um, the friend who was in the accident who fell, he's doing a lot better. Now, he's still, he's been moved to another hospital and they're trying to get him to um, a physiotherap physiotherapist that's nearby so he can move to that hospital 
but uh, apparently the um, the doctor who was doing all this didn't get him on the list like he claims to have gotten him, and so he's a little bit far away for his uh, for his wife. She's having to travel a good bit of distance just to go see him, you know, and and um, so it's it's been affecting affecting her. She's tired. She's a bit stressed. A lot of things going on, but he has gotten help now at the farm. Someone who's really good who's come in. He's taken over the, the, the running of the farm, the, the, the primary stuff, you know, when it comes to the what you physically have to do, like milking the cows and, and, uh, and uh, this kind of stuff, you know. But, um, yeah, things are, are rolling along. But uh, he still has a good bit of ways to go. And right now he's not getting any physiotherapy because where they put him. And um, so hopefully we can get this ironed out or they can get it ironed out very soon and get him on – a better on the road to recovery, you know, so that he can get back to his, his life, you know. Um, and um, tomorrow, actually, they're, they're having their 25th anniversary together, so really happy for them. But uh, anyway, um, not tomorrow, day after tomorrow, Wednesday, that's it. Anyway, um, I want to thank all of you for your prayers for them, for him, though, and for them, and, and please continue doing that, and and for your prayers for me, you know. Um, I still need your, I still need those prayers myself, you know. Um, I'm a, I'm a believing, I'm a believer and, uh, and, um, I can't say anything more than that, you know, uh, but, um, and I'm getting to see my daughter soon. So maybe, just maybe I'm going to try to get her on, on the video this week and, uh, talk to her a bit about her studies. Um, and maybe it'd be my first, um, interview with somebody <laughs> for a podcast. <laughs> that would be pretty interesting if I can get her to do that. You know, I don't know if she will, she, she probably won't fight me about it, but, uh, she's really, um, um, impressed me a lot this whole year uh, since she's been in school, and uh, I definitely want to would like to talk about that and get some honest feedback from her about that because she's really grown a lot in the past year, um, not just in age but also uh, uh, um, in her in her mental and her strength, you know, her discipline, this kind of stuff. And she's working really hard and, and doing very well in school. But uh, she's back home right now. She's with her mother, and I'll see her in a couple of days. She'll do she'll do an overnight here with me before. She travels a bit, and then she's going to come back and spend even more time with me. And I'm looking forward to that. But anyway, listen, I'm going to let you go. I want to thank you. Keep keep me in your in your thoughts. And when it comes to the channel, please like, share, subscribe, thumbs up, all that kind of good stuff, and get the word out there. And hopefully, you know, um, hopefully we can get this thing growing. You know, um, I like to see a lot more people. I'm impressed by by the number of people who've already come and watched my videos and who've communicated with me. And, and I just want to say thank you. And uh, I hope I can help you where I, where I can. If you have any questions, please drop them, drop them in the comments. And I answer all comments, all of them. Well, right now, there are many of them, but I answer them. <laughs> you have a good night, and I hope to see you again very soon. Bye-bye.